Hi everyone, I'm Gary Knoll. Always nice to be here to share empowering and information. Information that can change the quality and direction of our lives. How to reverse the aging process, slow it down. How to prevent disease. How to be happy at a time when a lot of people are suffering emotionally. That's what we do. Today, we're going to deal with all that. We're going to have a look at a letter that I wrote to Gerald Salante that he published about how to deal with COVID at this time from a nutrition and, and a point of view that will help your immune system. Also today, how regular walnut consumption may reduce negative outcomes for H. pylori infection. Journal of Clinical Biochemistry and Nutrition. It was done at the CHA Cancer Prevention Center in South Korea. And by the way, that stomach problem you've had, some consider it a stomach virus sometimes, or an ulcer, that's all generally from H. pylori, helicobacter, it's a bacterium. And by knowing how to fight it, you can overcome it. Knowing how to eat, you can prevent it. And regular walnut consumption can reduce the negative outcome. So we're going to talk about that. Then we have a guest on the second part of our program, and that guest is Professor Mickey Huff. He'll be out in San Francisco, and we're going to talk to him today about all the things that are going on about censorship. Now, there's no better person I know about censorship because he's the director of Project Censored and the president of the nonprofit Media Freedom Foundation. He's a professor of sociology at Diablo Valley College in San Francisco Bay Area, where he co-chairs and is chair in its history and journalism departments, respectively. He's also on the advisor committee for the history of conflict at John F. Kennedy University. And he is very concerned, as you should be. So we're going to talk with him for almost a half hour. I'll go to him a little early to get more of that insight. Also today, I'll share some additional input from someone, and I'd like to see if anyone in the audience knows who the speaker is when you hear him. He is one very smart person, and he's giving us some wonderful insights about life and if we go in the wrong direction with our career or anything else. So we're going to talk about that as well. So we have a really interesting and varied program lined up, and I'm going to bring you up to date on some other issues as well. But we always start with the latest on health and healing. So what we know now is an article just published in the Journal of Clinical Biochemistry and Nutrition. It shows that those who eat walnuts on a regular basis, which you should be doing anyhow for your heart, it's a promising intervention for reducing negative outcomes associated with Helicobacter or H. pylori infection, widespread bacterial infection that affects more than half the world's population. So they found that it has strong anti-inflammatory actions in the gut that can safeguard us. So that's terrific. It's good. And onions and garlic and apples happen to be three of the foods that can turn off a tremendous amount of inflammation, including cytokine storms. From the University of Osaka in Japan, drinking green tea lowers the risk of death for stroke and heart attack survivors. Stroke and heart attack survivors can reduce multiple causes of death and prevent further cardiovascular events by drinking green tea. This was published in Peer Review Journal Stroke, a journal of the American Stroke Association. The study also found daily consumption helps survivors lower their risk overall of having another stroke. So that's good news. That's because of the chemicals in them. So there are thousands of studies on green tea. This one had 46,000 participants. And uh, this was from J the Japan Collaborative Cohort Study for Evaluation of Cancer Risk. And uh, it was in 45 communities across Japan. Those who consumed about 3.4 ounces of green tea 
uh, had an improvement. That's not a lot of green tea. Even if you consume six ounces of green tea, it's not a lot of green tea. It's one cup a day. And then they compared those who consumed that amount of green tea for those who didn't. And there was a quote, when compared with participants who rarely drank green tea, stroke survivors who consumed at least the green tea lowered their risk of all-cause mortality by approximately 62%. Wow, 62%. Now, I would suggest if you've had a heart attack or stroke, you consume about seven cups a day. Now, you can't drink seven cups. You can certainly take easy enough the amount of green tea that you would find the beneficial effects in the capsules, about 1,000 milligrams in the capsules. That would help you for the whole day. We think of melatonin being secreted by the tiny little pineal gland as important for helping to helping to heal the brain, stimulate the immune system. It's a great antioxidant. Helps you get a better night's sleep. All true. Now China Medical University has found that it has something else. Melatonin shows promise as a therapeutic option for diabetic osteoporosis. Now, osteoporosis is a common disease resulting in deterioration of the microarchitecture and the decreased bone mass in our bodies. And in type 2 diabetes patients, the incidence of osteoporosis is really high. And, and it's accompanied by an increased apoptosis of osteoblasts. Not good. So when you are taking melatonin, and it wasn't even at high doses, it made a difference. So if you have diabetic osteoporosis, make sure you're getting, I would suggest three milligrams, not a high amount. So therefore you're helping a better night's sleep, but you're also helping your osteoporosis. From Trinity College Dublin comes a study published in Psychology and Aging, and it's the first study to adjudicate between competing theories of age-related mind wandering. And uh, what it means is younger people tend to be restless, older people tend to be more focused. So there's a big difference in what is called mind wandering, where your mind's wandering someplace else instead of being focused upon your tasks to hand. <clears throat> I would have found this far more interesting study if they would have had a third variable, and that is people who meditate regularly, and then compare their mind wandering, since they're training themselves not to allow the mind to wander, but to be focused against people who are younger or older. So when your mind's wandering, you're not focused. If you're not focused, then there's not a lot of constructive outcomes from it. So that's what this is showing us. All right. Then from the University of Edinburgh comes a study about the Mediterranean diet. It's linked to stronger thinking skills later in life. People who eat a Mediterranean-style diet, that's not a vegan diet, because they do use fish and some use dairy, and uh, but they generally use organic produce, in my own personal experience traveling throughout the Mediterranean many times, when talking with farmers, talking with people who go to the market every day, in fact, I would go to the market, for example, in, in France and Italy every morning, and they start much earlier than what we do. <clears throat> in fact, you'll see trucks arriving to put their food in the stalls. And there was one farmer's market that was the size of an entire city block. I mean, it would, imagine two football fields covered. That's how big this was. And so people get on their bikes or cars and they drive there. They uh, select their food and they take it home. They don't have a lot of food at home. They like fresh every day. And when I'm talking to, and I felt a little foolish doing it because I was asking them about pesticides. They understand how toxic the pesticides were and that it's sprayed heavily on grapes and other produce. And they just smiled at me. 
as if no one in Europe understood the dangerous pesticides. Of course they understood the dangerous pesticides. And that's why they like to eat local. And that's why they didn't use them in their own gardens. And that's why there were places the vendors knew how things were grown and could really be instructive to someone who didn't appreciate this. I mean, I, I ate in restaurants where wherever it was possible, they got unsprayed food. All over the world, people know the dangers of pesticides because there's been so many people injured by them. In any case, that Mediterranean diet is where people are eating a lot of fresh, green, leafy vegetables. It's very low in meat, and they're staying mentally sharp later in life. Closely adhering to the Mediterranean diet was associated with higher scores on a range of memory and thinking tests among adults in their late 70s. The study found no link, however, between the Mediterranean diet and better brain health. For that, they would have to go to a vegan diet. Remember, these latest findings suggest this is primarily plant-based diet is beneficial for cognitive functioning as we get older. It increases our thinking skills, and that's important. But you also have to be taking the right supplements for the brain. The diet in itself won't do that for you. Also from the Carnegie Mellon University and University of Pittsburgh, they found that COVID-related depression is linked to reduced physical activity. So, this was published by the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, get out and exercise, bike, power walk, jog, but get out and you really got to exercise. That will help you with depression. That's what this showed. That's the latest on health and healing. I have more on health coming. In a moment, I'm going to share with you some insights uh, concerning what happens when we're not sure what to do about our immune system, so we're just waiting for the government. That's not necessarily the best advice you could take as the government because they're going to say the vaccine or wait till a drug comes. And I'm suggesting, what if... What if there was a way that we could do something for ourselves? Okay, I'm going to show you. It's published in the current issue of, of Trends Magazine. Right after the break, I'll share that insight with you. I'd like to welcome all of you. I'm Gary Nall. This is in the current issue of Trends Research Institute, which is in its 40th year. And it's the world leader in honest trends forecasting, Trends Journal. And my friend, has been a friend for a long time, Gerald Salante, he's one of the great uh, social warriors that we need. He's not afraid. He's fearless. Tells the truth and <laughs> at full velocity. So he said, would I help bring more uh, people aware of the trends in health? And I said, sure. So I want to share with all of you. As the COVID pandemic rolls on, Health-minded people are eager and sometimes desperate to know whether there are ways to strengthen the body's immune system to protect themselves. Following the first cases of the virus in the United States and announcements indicating it would be spread, spreading rapidly across the nation, I've received numerous requests from my radio and Internet's audience for information about how they can best protect themselves from infection. Now, most ask about what foods and supplements make him for protection? Legitimate questions. It's impossible for us to avoid exposure to SARS-2 in every case. We contract and harbor numerous viruses and bacteria during our lives, but are usually asymptomatic. Therefore, no nutrient will prevent infection. However, many will certainly strengthen our defense mechanisms and can protect us from developing a serious symptomatic infection. Most of us have been infected with the coronavirus strain at some time in our lives. Along with many other common viruses, coronaviruses are associated with a common cold. It is only during the past 19 years that newer strains have become more virulent and pose greater respiratory risks. The first was the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or SARS. 
outbreak between 2002 and 2004, and then the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS, in 2014. I believe that based upon the best research, these could be due to gain of, re, uh, gain of function research. I absolutely positively believe that the current SARS-19 is due to gain of function research done through the National Institute of Allergy and Health, Anthony Fauci's group, and sponsoring that specific research, because I published an article on this showing the actual money trail, how much money was given to the research lab in North Carolina, and then how when Barack Obama put a moratorium on that, and he did, good for him. No more of this because our own National Institute of Health was showing serious problems with gain of function research and viruses getting out. There had been leaks before, including in North Carolina, where a, a person, a scientist working, a woman in this particular laboratory, was fully clothed, had double layer gloves, picked up a squirrel that had been infected inside the lab, and it bit through the gloves, broke her skin, therefore she was infected. They didn't close down the lab. They didn't quarantine her. They broke all protocols. So if you wonder, could it have gotten out the Wuhan lab? And I'm absolutely certain it did, not intentionally. Uh, well, we have an example of that in our own backyard. So once this was all stopped, no more funding, Anthony Fauci went around the back and funded it to the tune of $3.7 million. And the man that he gave the money to do this research, did the funding in North Carolina, and then a scientist with money going to the Wuhan Research Institute for continuing gain of research. And that same man... Da uh, Professor Daszak, he is now the one, the World Health Organization, has said, find us where this originated from. Oh, it originated naturally from bats. Uh, nothing, nothing to see here. Move on, everyone. No. He spent three hours in the Wuhan lab. But, of course, you know that this is going to be a whitewash because it's the World Health Organization, and we all know what kind of reputation they have for accuracy and ethics. In any case... My producer and I have scoured the peer review literature. I'm talking about thousands of studies on the National Institutes of Health Library of Medicine database that's open to everyone to identify compelling studies that may warrant vitamin, antioxidant, and botanical supplementation as a means to protect ourselves from coronavirus and other viral infections. These have been shown to either have strong antiviral properties in general or have known biomolecular effects to strengthen your immune system against microbial infection. Now, we're not offering prescriptions. This is just a summary of some important medical information about certain nutrients and botanicals to make better informed decisions for strengthening your immune system and to protect yourself from serious SARS-CoV-2 symptoms. Very early in the epidemic, Xinjiang Hospital of China Medical University published a paper recommending people have a nutritional evaluation before any conventional treatment. The paper recommended people follow a regimen of vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E, the omega-3 fatty acids, selenium, and zinc. Let me repeat. Vitamin C, D, E, selenium, zinc, and omega-3 fatty acids. I would also follow the recommendations of Dr. Paul Merrick, M-A-R-K, in the Pulmonary and Critical Care Division at Eastern Virginia Medical School and include a daily intake of quercetin, that's Q-U-E-R-C-E-T-I-N, quercetin, a flavonoid abundantly found in apples, grapes, onions, and green leafy vegetables, has a synergistic antiviral effect and increases vitamin C's immune modulatory properties. I always recommend vitamin C be taken with quercetin, generally in half amount. 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C, 500 milligrams of quercetin. Vitamin D is also crucial because serious COVID-19 illnesses and deaths appear among those who are almost always vitamin D deficient. It is necessary to supplement zinc, a common regimen for treating SARS-2 infections now prescribed by Maverick American Physicians and 
more approvingly in other nations is a combination of hydroxychloroquine or the antibiotic azomycin and zinc. Zinc has been shown to ward off and reduce the onset of colds and flu-like symptoms, but using hydroxychloroquine together with zinc works. There are other normally found uh, drugs that are FDA approved and been used for some for 65 years, and uh, but unfortunately, no one is suggesting you use those within the current COVID medical hierarchy. I cannot tell you why. You can only judge for yourself. But there are now hundreds of studies, including in the peer review literature, that fully support ivermectin at small doses, three to five milligrams preventatively, 15 milligrams for a whole day, knocking everything out in a day or two for most people. Even if you are sick enough to go to a hospital, it can make a huge difference and save a lot of lives. But we've known this from day one. So why haven't we been advocating things that we know and proven can make a difference? Again, I cannot tell you what's going on in the minds of Anthony Fauci or all the scientists, the World Health Organization, National Cancer Institute, National Institute for Allergy Infection. You would have to ask them, can I tell you with absolute certainty that these work? In most cases, yes. The scientific peer review literature is there. I have published articles. I published the entire peer review literature on it. You can judge that for yourself. And yet they have a whole campaign to attack anyone using it, suggesting it works. Why? Again, you'll have to ask them. A 2010 study by scientists at Leiden University Center for Infectious Disease concluded that zinc, just normal zinc, will block the replication of coronavirus. Another important nutrient that has had an excellent history to back its efficacy is the important antioxidant NAC, that stands for N-acetylcysteine. That's A-C-E-T-Y-L, acetylcysteine, C-Y-S-T-E-I-N-E, NAC. Our lungs are especially susceptible to oxidative stress, which becomes a pathway for the microbial infections and can trigger inflammatory cytokines. NAC is one antioxidant shown to reduce clinical symptoms following viral infections. The uh, Johanna Goethe Department of Virology recommends NAC to decrease inflammation due to respiratory viruses such as influenza. There is also strong evidence that severe coronavirus cases and deaths are associated with cytokine, that's C-Y-T-O-K-I-N-E, cytokine storms, besides secondary infections such as pneumonia. One cytokine in particular is NLP, excuse me, NLRP3. It's associated with SARS uh, COVID infections. The amino acid melatonin has the unique property of inhibiting NLRP3 elevations after infection. Therefore, everyone should be having 5 milligram in hospitals, 10 milligram. I mean, uh, of the melatonin, the amino acid, to help people who are coming in with those infections. And that can prevent the cytokine storms contributing to acute respiratory distress syndrome and acute lung injury that are characteristic of severe SARS infections. Early last March, we stumbled unexpectedly upon a botanical compound, glyceryacin acid, or what is simply called GA, which surprisingly has been studied at a number of different medical institutions to treat the first SARS virus. This glyceryacin acid is an active antiviral molecule found in licorice. No, you won't get it by eating licorice. In the ancient medical system of China and India and Greece, licorice is found in their pharmaceutical pias for treating sore throats, bronchitis, respiratory infections. During the past 15 years, this nutrient has been shown to be very impressive. In early 19, uh, 2005, German scientists and the Russian Academy of Sciences identified the molecule's antiviral activity against SARS coronavirus. It had a 10 
fold, that's a thousand percent increase in anti-SARS activity compared to other potential treatments tested. One conjugate had a 70 fold, 70 fold increase in its antiviral activity. Again, something that should be used in all hospitals and all critical care centers. The same year, a separate Chinese Academy of Science study arrived at similar results. Virologists at Frankfurt University's medical school investigated several antiviral compounds to treat patients admitted with SARS infections. Of all the compounds tested, licorice's extract was the most effective. The scientists concluded, quote, our findings suggest that glycericin should be assessed for treatment of SARS, end quote. That study was later replicated at Sun Yat-sen University in China. Another botanical I would recommend is astragalus, A-S-T-R-A-G-A-L-U-S. It's commonly prescribed throughout Asia. Its active compounds are called saponins, S-A-P-O-N-I-N-S. They're well-researched and recommended for their effectiveness against viral infections and overstress respiratory conditions. Beijing University of Chinese Medicine completed an analysis of previous research looking at the benefits of astragalus herbal formulas against SARS and H1N1 swine flu. In three studies among participants who took the formulas against SARS, none contracted the illness, nor did any contract H1N1 influenza in four additional studies. I could recommend many other supplements and botanical medicines to complement what I just said. However, in my opinion, what I'm offering seems to be the best selection for your buck and is supported by the peer-reviewed scientific literature. Other ways to supplement a stronger immune system will include foods that increase the body's nitric oxide, dark chocolate, rhubarb, beets, pomegranate, and green leafy vegetables. One of the best is elderberry, also echinacea, olive leaf extract, wild oregano oil, and extracts from the plant. Well, not even that. Just, I wouldn't necessarily use wild oregano oil unless you know how to use it. It's going to burn your throat. You have to really dilute it. So everything except that. However, none of these nutrients or foods or botanicals can prevent a person from being in contact with an infected person and contracting SARS-2 themselves. Nevertheless, they will strengthen the immune system and effectively fight infection, all infections. Besides, these are safe and not expensive. A hard lesson we are learning is that the U.S. government has no noteworthy competence in dealing with national health crisis, let alone a pandemic. We are only good at pouring money into the personal bank accounts of the elites and pharmaceutical companies who won't turn down a good opportunity to capitalize on disasters. If the tiny virus is David, certainly the U.S. is cumbersomeness and huge bureaucracy is Goliath. Therefore, we need to be responsible for our health to protect us from COVID. If progressive voices are unable to leverage themselves to change the face of our civilization for a potentially sustainable future, then this tiny SARS virus is determined to do it for us. I'm Gary Knoll. That is an article I just published this week in Trends Journal from the Trends Research Institute, George Lante's group. We're going to take a break, and when we come back from the break, we're going to have a talk with Mickey Huff on what's going on with everybody being censored. I'm very concerned. I hope you are as well. We'll get his input. Please stay with us. I'd like to welcome you. We're going to go to our guest, Mickey Hupp, but he is not available at this moment. When he comes on, we'll break back over to him. But I was going to play you a clip. I want you to see if you know who it is. Younger people may not know who it is. Older people should know. But it's important what he has to say, and it's very timely. You see, the reason you want to be better is the reason why you aren't. We aren't better because we want to be. Because the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Because 
All the do-gooders in the world, whether they're doing good for others or doing it for themselves, are troublemakers. On the basis of kindly let me help you or you'll drown, said the monkey, putting the fish safely up a tree. <laughs> We white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, British, German, American, have been on a rampage for the past hundred or more years to improve the world. We have given the benefits of our culture, our religion, our technology to everybody, except perhaps the Australian Aborigines. And we have insisted that they receive the benefits of our culture, even our political styles, our democracy. You had better be democratic, or we'll shoot you. <laughs> and having conferred these blessings all over the place, we wonder why everybody hates us. See, because sometimes doing good to others, and even doing good to oneself, is amazingly destructive. Because it's full of conceit. How do you know what's good for other people? How do you know what's good for you? If you say uh, you want to improve, then you ought to know what's good for you. But obviously you don't. Because if you did, you would be improved. So we don't know. It's like the problem of geneticists which they face today. I went to a meeting of geneticists not so long ago where they gathered in a group of philosophers and theologians and said, now look here, we need help. We now are on the verge of figuring out how to breed any kind of human character uh, we would want to have. We can give you saints, philosophers, scientists, great politicians, anything you want, just tell us what kind of human beings ought we to breed. So, I said, how will those of us who are genetically unregenerate make up our minds what genetically generate people might be? Because I'm afraid very much that our selection of virtues may not work. It may be like, for example, this new kind of high-yield grain which is made and uh, which is becoming ecologically destructive. When we interfere with the processes of nature and breed efficient plants and efficient animals, there's always some way in which we have to pay for it. And I can well see that eugenically produced human beings might be dreadful. We could have a plague of virtuous people do you realize that? Any animal considered in itself is virtuous, it does its thing, but in crowds they're awful. Like a crowd of ants or locusts on the rampage. They're all perfectly good animals, but it's just too much. I could imagine a perfectly pestiferous mass of a million saints. <laughs> So I said to these people, look, there's the only thing you can do. Just be sure that a vast variety of human beings is maintained. Don't please breed us down to a few excellent types. Excellent for what? We never know how circumstances are going to change. And how our need for different kinds of people changes. At one time, we may need very individualistic and aggressive people. At another time, we may need very cooperative, teamworking people. At another time, we may need people who are full of interest in dexterous manipulation of the external world. At another time, we may need people who explore into their own psychology and are introspective. There is no knowing. But the more varieties and the more skills we have, obviously, the better. So, you see, here again, the problem comes out in genetics. We do not really know how to interfere with the way the world is. The way the world actually is, is an enormously complex interrelated organism. 
of Onnell and listen to what he said. Do you know who it was? Alan Watts. He died in 1973, so his voice was a very prophetic one. Many people are so self-righteous today, including a lot within the liberal class, to say that we know what the right speech is, and you're not speaking right, so you should not have a right to speak. You should even be punished for speaking. And I want my guest to address this. Do we have a new form of McCarthyism today, but dressed up to look like it is anti-McCarthyism, protecting the public from wrong thoughts, wrong mindset? And who is to judge? They are to judge. Who's in control? They're in control. Are they ever wrong? Never wrong. Do they ever apologize? Never. Professor Mickey Huff, I gave your bio at the beginning of the program. Would you begin, please, to ask, ask this audience what they know about this pandemic and the end of free speech, end of a free press, end of being able to question if science should be, the absolute statements of an Anthony Fauci or World Health Organization or anyone, what they should do and not do, and questioning that suddenly puts your whole career, your life, in jeopardy. The form is yours. Hi, Gary. Thanks so much for having, uh, having us on the program. It's Project Censored. It's been a while since uh, we've spoken to you. Um, it's, uh, we're honored to be aired as the Project Censored show on the Progressive, Progressive Radio Network. Um, and also recently had the pleasure of uh, being on with Christina Borgeson, who is an award-winning uh, broadcaster with you all at the Whistleblower Newsroom, who does very important reporting about the kinds of things that you're talking about right now, um, as do we at Project Censored, and that's reporting the news that doesn't make the news and analyze why, honoring the voice of whistleblowers and people inside of systems that want to call out things that they see that don't jive with what public messages are, um, and try to out uh, deceptive practices, uh, whether it's Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning in the <clears throat> in the collateral murder video from Iraq, uh, whether it is uh, the, the uh, secrets of Edward Snowden uh, revealing the NSA as rank liars and uh, wanton surveillers, uh, whether it's uh, a, a John Kiriakou blowing the whistle inside the CIA for torture. Um, we see across the spectrum in our society, post 9-11, uh, the grip of fear to restrict expression of various kinds. And it's really important that we recognize uh, what our principles as a society are and don't so willfully sacrifice them at the altars of convenience and uh, safety, per se. Uh, ben Franklin ages ago once quipped uh, something to the effect uh, about liberties and safeties, right? And people that were concerned about their safety so that they would willingly trade liberty for safety. And Franklin said that those who would surrender liberty for safety deserve neither. That is, they would be irresponsible wards of such an important principle like liberty. Um, and what we're seeing right now, Gary, going on, and Project Censored has actually even been victim of this, in an ironic twist, um, one of our critical media literacy conferences was actually pulled from YouTube without warning a month or so ago. Um, no warning, no reasoning. Some of the leading voices in critical media literacy calling out corporate media propaganda, big tech censorship. Um, we showcased Sophia Noble on algorithms of oppression. Uh, 20 some hours of video gone, disappeared down the Orwellian memory hole. And in Kafka-esque fashion, when we tried to inquire about what happened, they claimed the videos never existed. And um, if Winston Smith from 1984 were alive today, he might be a so-called fact checker, uh, maybe, maybe working for the Atlantic Council at Facebook or programming algorithms to rewrite historical headlines um, at what passes for our major public platforms today, like YouTube, which is not public. It's private. And thus, thus we get into our big dilemma about who controls um, not just the bigger picture of Edward Bernays and propaganda and who controls the wires, uh, who pulls the wires that control the public mind, but who are these tech platforms? What are their algorithms? Who programs them? Who determines what voices are heard and not heard? Um, you know, in a great twist of irony, and, and I can say this too, Gary, without, without my necessarily agreeing with any particular piece of information that's censored, I can still walk and chew gum at the same time. 
and suggest that deplatforming and censoring of voices that go against mainstream thought uh, are the very voices we need to hear if we are to understand where we're heading as a society. And so, you know, our deplatforming we thought was a chilling one um, because we don't see ourselves as radical extremists. We see ourselves as scholars teaching media and civic literacy, teaching the next generation of people to be intrepid journalists, truth tellers, uh, how to be civically engaged. Um, that's what our conference was all about. And it was disappeared, the Critical Media Literacy Conference of the Americas. Alan McLeod from Mint Press News wrote a great piece on that. Um, and, and in another uh, alarming example, we've seen, and by the way, even though we at Project Censored had long criticized Alex Jones and Infowars and criticized um, his reporting and his screeds, uh, we didn't call for his censorship. We called for more speech condemning the things that he was saying that were misguided or unfactually supported. The antidote to speech we don't like isn't censorship, it's more speech and it's more open argumentation and debate supported by transparent facts. In another twist of recent uh, days, and as you well know, Gary, uh, Robert Kennedy, uh, the son of the former attorney general, uh, who himself was assassinated, was taken off of Instagram for his posts about uh, medical safety issues while he was citing government documents. Um, there's a lot of irony there. Uh, and there's a lot of deception often involved in censorship, um, Gary, as you know, where the would-be censors like to recast what people are doing and saying in straw purse and fashion to rip apart their arguments to distract away from what people may actually, in fact, be saying. And that's why, um, you know, we're really, uh, Peter Phillips and I at the project over a decade ago said we were living in what we called a truth emergency that we lived in a society awash in information at our digital fingertips, but had a paucity of understanding of what it meant. And this combination of, of a half century of neoliberal privatization policies that have gutted our educational systems um, and these, these policies that have privatized education and taken civic literacy and critical thinking away at a time when our news media became more and more concentrated and owned by six corporations. Um, you know, as the... Uh, great Lao Tzu once wrote, if you do not change direction, you may end up where you're heading. Well, I ask you and your audience, Gary, are we there yet? Where are we heading? We learned, we let's listen to Alan Watts. I was a big uh, reader of, an avid reader of Alan Watts. In fact, I actually, in high school in the 1980s, I was suspended from high school because I decided not to go to one of their fascist sport pep rallies for the football team and genuflect before the, the, uh, the altars of idiocracy. And I sat in the school lobby reading Alan Watts' Wisdom and Insecurity. And <clears throat> the following day, I was called into the principal's office to say, well, why were you not properly cheering for the team at the pep rally? And I said, well, I was reading. And the, the principal said to me, well, what do you think, this is school? <laughs> um, I said, well, my mistake. Um, so, you know, I learned, I learned early on, I grew up in Pennsylvania, I, I learned early on that there were many forces that pushed conformity, indoctrination, um, scared people away from independent thought and questioning. And it just made a, an impression on me, Gary, that really that did lead me all the way to California and Project Censored, where I've been since 2000, directing since 2010. Um, you know, and it, it is a life's calling to, to be a truth teller, to shine the light in dark places where, where you can uh, help elevate uh, the voices and cries of those who the corporate media don't care about and our corporatist, a big te uh, technocratic government uh, can't be bothered with. And I think that we can turn around this crisis that we're in. It's an epistemological crisis where people don't know where to turn, don't know whom to trust. And we've seen extraordinary decay in trust, but that decay was earned. That, dec that decay didn't just uh, sprout out overnight. It came because our institutions have failed us. They've been corrupted from within. They've been bought up through regulatory capture and through uh, corporate greed. And in many cases, the very principles at the root of American society have been wrested from even the imagination of uh, an another generation of Americans, Gary. And this pandemic has been a great cover. It's been a very real one. Uh, COVID is a very real uh, virus and a very dangerous one, but we see that people haven't really been playing 
with all the facts. And, you know, whether that's Andrew Cuomo in New York, uh, who we, we now know was hiding statistics and information about people, elderly people uh, dying and so forth. Um, and we've also seen it even from leaders at the, uh, at the CDC or, or Anthony Fauci, Dr. Anthony Fauci. Um, this is also another example or an opportunity, Gary, to, rep- to, to, to call out the, the, the use that people have of science as a weapon, much like language is a weapon and la- weaponization of terms like conspiracy theorist, right? Originally weaponized by the CIA in the 60s after the Warren Commission report. You can read about that in Lance DeHaven Smith's great book, Conspiracy Theory in America on University of Texas Press from a few years ago in Mark Crispin Miller's excellent series. Um, but you know, back to this idea, when people talk about science, many people are talking about scientism. That is the blind belief rather than open questioning methodologically of institutions that do have interests at heart and they're not always the public interests. And so when we ask basic questions or we point out the foibles of our own major institutions using their own words, um, those in turn are turned around against those that want to ask questions. And again, I don't think everybody deserves the same kind of platform per se, and certainly not to espouse known falsehoods. But we also need to be really careful about who is determining what is true and false in our society and you know, who are the arbiters of wisdom and knowledge and what are they doing uh, to further educate society and build trust rather than instill fear. And so one of the great missions that Project Censored since 1976 has been to allow the public to see news that doesn't really make the major news, not because it's not factual, but because it might be unpopular and because it might challenge the status quo and the very institutions that are used as glue to hold our societies together. For better or worse, Mickey, Gary, Mickey, I go appreciate, ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I appreciate these overviews, but I'd like for you to deal with something specifically. We've been doing a lot of research and writing on the Great Reset, which is being mm-hmm. launched, launched by the World Economic Forum and its hundreds of corporate partners, almost all of them corporations that have polluted the environment or captured people's uh, uh, secret data and uh, or have exploited them through payday loans and, uh, mm-hmm. and exorbitant interest rates. These are their partners. So one of the issues of the press is, <clears throat> is that the forum document is that the news will be in the future generated by computer algorithms. They will determine what is true. And as a result, we won't need fact checkers because all fact checking will be done by a centralized, anonymous algorithm source. In other words, human reporters and certainly their contextual framing of stories in the news will be obsolete. That means that people who control the algorithms, which are the tech companies, will control virtually all information. They're happy. Bill Gates is happy when kids are not in school because they can learn by computer. There's a whole movement, uh, and this just worked to their advantage because there's no real scientific and public health reason to have closed down the schools. That's been a red herring all along. But if you get everyone believing the best way and safest way for your child to learn is by the programming of classes so that teachers no longer exist, they're a part of a algorithm, computerized and conceptualized way of reaching your child, then you've locked in every door of a society that once was a door to openness, freedom, and exploration. Have you looked at that at all? And if our sources for news are dominated by algorithms, and we must remember that even these are not without biases, since there are people programming these algorithms for corporations with their own agendas, how will this further destroy a free press and free speech? Well, Gary, this is, of course, we've covered this. We've, we've warned about it for years. Uh, we haven't just talked about it. We've warned about it. We've cataloged it. Um, and it fills the pages of our annual books, our weekly radio show, our recent documentary, United States of Distraction, Fighting the Fake News Invasion, talks all about this process. Our, our conference was likely w- taken down from YouTube by an algorithm. Um, and we have to remember, as you said, that this technocratic dystopia that you describe was laid out um, decades ago by people like Neil Postman, 
who wrote uh, not just Amusing Ourselves to Death in 1985, but Technopoly in 1992. Um, Sophia Noble, whom I mentioned before, wrote a book called Algorithms of Oppression about how these big tech company algorithms um, are completely biased against certain sectors of society. Not surprisingly, those biases mirror the upper class of technocrats that program them. And, Mickey, uh, hold one, Mickey, hold just one second, because our WBAI audience has to separate to hear the news. We're mm -hmm. continuing top of the hour. My guest is Mickey Huff from Project Censored. Please continue, Mickey. Thanks, Gary. Um, and uh, <clears throat> again, this, this is uh, and the interesting thing, I think, about this is that many people have been long unaware that this is actually happening. Um, and the way in which censorship has been covered, particularly around social media, it's always seemed to be like, well, that was just someone's crazy uncle or that was just someone's uh, really far out view or um, we don't really care about that. But the big problem with that is that this has been a systemic campaign to winnow uh, the frame of discussion and debate in the public sphere by private for profit companies that were uh, given the ability to develop this technology by the military industrial surveillance complex with taxpayer money going back half a century. Uh, and, you know, as Edward Snowden quipped uh, not too long ago, that ages ago, our surveillance programs had to be very sophisticated. They had to be very secretive. You know, people in the 60s worried about, is my phone tapped? Um, nowadays, um, we willingly give up our privacy and all of our information to share stories on Facebook or on Twitter or on Instagram. And as Snowden said, these are the most ingenious surveillance tools ever created in Aldous Huxley fashion, where we are addicted to our own pleasures, desires, and servitude through big tech algorithms. And I think it's far more pernicious and insidious, and I don't believe I'm being hyperbolic, I think that this wave of the future portends negatively. It, um, under the guise of protection and safety, uniformity and progress, what we're seeing is a destruction of the public sphere. We're seeing a dismantling of an in intellectual infrastructure that allows for complicated civil disagreements about key topics of the day. We're seeing wanton punishment of anybody that doesn't fit inside of a box to check. Um, in many ways, you know, we've gone backwards uh, from where we may have been even 100 years ago in the so-called progressive era in the heyday of muckraking journalism and Lincoln Steffens and Ida Tarbell and Upton Sinclair. Those people exist today, Gary, but they exist at places like Pacifica or they exist at independent small alternative networks that are increasingly being silenced and deplatformed by these very institutions. And it's not a surprise that most of uh, the corporate media don't report about the World Economic Forum. Uh, in fact, a Time Magazine not long ago, I don't know, your listeners probably know this, but they don't use the same covers in the United States as they use in their European or Asian or other international markets. And in the United States, they'll have one cover, you know, it'll be like, well, is anxiety good for you? Or uh, what's happening in the Trump circus? Um, meanwhile, a time over a month ago, they had a cover story and a whole issue dedicated to the Great Reset, where they, you know, talked about, I'm granted, they talked about it from the perspective of the World Economic Forum, for the most part, but they didn't pretend it didn't exist. If you're, if you live in the United States, and you talk about the Great Reset, people think you're some kind of QAnon, um, you know, parlor uh, conspiracist, that's just talking about Pizzagate, um, and talking about Democratic Party pedophile rings. And look, I'm not saying some of those things, uh, you know, the Epstein scandals and so on haven't been cover-ups. But what I'm also suggesting is that the in the United States, ironically, in a society that is so, so allegedly informed and technologically sophisticated, we are one of the more obedient, less questioning societies of the modern era. And I think, again, that goes back to the way in which our media is structured, the way in which our schooling and educational system is structured. Schooling is programming and propaganda. It's not instilling critical thinking skills in the public in a way that Paulo Freire and critical pedagogy or even John Dewey would do 100 years ago. And this is what we've argued over the years, Gary, in our books. And, you know, Peter Phillips wrote all about this in Giants, the Power Elite. 
he wrote about who these very people are at the, the World Economic Forum and what their interests are and what their networks are, what their monies are, how their monies are all interconnected, what they're trying to do with it, how they're trying to digitalize not only currency, but information in a way that there is no privacy and there is only conformity. And without it, there would be punishment. And I know that sounds dystopian. And I know for some of your listeners that listeners that might even sound hyperbolic, but I'll go back to Lao Tzu. No, it's, if we don't change directions, we're going to end up where we're heading. And we're not make, heading toward an Edward Bellamy-like socialist utopia here. We're heading for a dystopian technocratic state and Mickey, a form of technocratic fascism in the 21st century. Mickey Huff. I'm sorry, Mickey, but we're out of time. If you would like to get more information, I'm talking about high quality and accurate information on all of our problems. The website is Project censored.org project censored.org and mickey huff h-u-f-f is uh along with peter phillips runs the project censored thank you very much mickey we look forward to our next conversation i'm gary and all we're out of time everyone have a nice day